So welcome, welcome to this afternoon's Sustainable Beekeeping Master Masterclass. I've got some slides, so I'm gonna share them um, with you. So that we can, there we go, right. So welcome. I hope you can hear me. It's quite loud here, but hopefully you'll be all right. Ah, oh, I've got somebody else in. No. So I better just wait a minute and let a few more. Okay, I can't let people away. I think I need to see who else is coming in. If you just type, if you just type in the um in the chat box about where you're from, what's your beekeeping journey at the moment? And what's your big question? What is it that you'd really like to know? Oh gosh, I've got a flood of people. This is the good with the rain, isn't it? What else what else can you do? <laughs> oh, I don't know if you can hear the bells, but I've got lots of bells ringing as people um, joining. So that's lovely. So yeah, so share in the chat. Welcome. Hello. Just share in the chat where you're from, where you're watching from, whether or not you've got bees, whether you want to have bees. I know that um, some of the people doing the challenge, they're not necessarily wanting to keep honeybees but they're very interested in being more conscious. So, um, so what I'm gonna do is share a bit about how you can be more conscious, the sort of things that you can do. So as you join, if you wouldn't mind removing um, or muting yourselves, so that if anything unexpected, unexpectedly noisy happens, then it won't distract. I am recording this. So if you don't want to have your your picture in it, oh, we've got more. So um, you know you can remove your camera if you, if you don't want to have your picture in the recording. But I will be recording it, and then I can share the um, the recording for people that can't make it today. So lovely, thank you. Lovely to see so many of you. So those of you who don't know who I am, oh gosh, we've got more. Yes. Lovely. Right. So I'm adding people in. I'm just wondering, Emma, are you able to add people in at all? Yeah, more and more people joining. Hello, welcome. Welcome to all of you. So when you come in, um, if you can gosh I don't think I've ever had so many people join me on a masterclass this is lovely I did a zoom on um for a beekeeping group a beekeeping association in Cambridge on Wednesday evening and they had over 111 people on zoom they had over 200 had subscribed so wanted to to watch it and they had to pay so I was the speaker but they had to buy tickets to to watch so hello welcome welcome all of you so as you join um my name's Paula if you didn't know who I was and I'm going to do a, a sort of master class on sustainable beekeeping and being more bee conscious so whether or not you want to have honeybees or you just want to be more aware of the other bees in the environment then that's what I'll be chatting about I'll also be giving you information about how I can help you further along with that journey and when I've 
finish the presentation, I will be asking answering questions as we go through. If you can type them in the chat, so I hope you can all find the chat, and then just let me know, um, you know, what it is that you'd like to know about. And at the end of the presentation, I will look through the chat and I will answer the questions. So hopefully that will will cover everything. So I hope you've got a cup of tea. Hope you're ready. Um, it's gone a little bit quiet now. We've just gone five past. So I think I will start the presentation. Right. So welcome. So um, what we're going to cover this afternoon is what exactly is sustainable beekeeping? Because you might be hearing all kinds of different versions of beekeeping and just not really clear about what means what and what the differences are. So if some of you are really brand new to beekeeping, you might not even be aware that there are these different ways of keeping bees and why some of them are, are kinder or more sustainable than others. So I'll talk then about kinder keeping and um, what that entails and also about native bee species because many of us are not aware that there isn't just the honeybee. It isn't just the honeybee that's pollinating everything and that is making honey and, and the wonderful bee that we have to save. There's a lot more bee species. And also I'll talk about more of the benefits of natural beekeeping. So not just for the bees, but also for yourself. And I've got this picture here actually shows a bee gym. Uh, so do comment in the chat if you know what a bee gym is. And you'll see it's this little yellow plastic device that actually has strips um, made out of like fishing wire and, and tape. And what the bees do is they scratch themselves on this bee gym. So for me, that was the first sort of natural varroa treatment that I tried when I was keeping bees. And you can see with this one, it's not actually inside the hive, it's outside the hive and underneath the hive. And you can see these bees have come from inside the hive and they're enjoying the bee gym. They're actually scratching on it. So bees don't do anything unless it's really important and vital for their survival. So they're not gonna do that unless it was good for them. So it was really great to see that bees will come outside a hive to use a bee gym because often we'll have gadgets or we'll have things that we put inside the hive. And of course, we don't know what's going on inside the hive. So we just have to guess. So it's great when you put something outside and you actually see them um, inside. So I would love to know how many of you are actually beekeepers. So make sure, you know, if you've just joined us, you comment, you say whether you're a beekeeper, whether you want to keep honeybees, whether you want to keep honeybees for pollination, for um, just to help the bees or whether you want to do it to, um, to actually help, um, you know, you want to have your own honey, whether you want to learn about beekeeping or whether you're just more interested in the, um, the whole balancing. You just don't know why you want to have bees. You know, maybe like me, you just want to have this connection with bees. That's how I got started. So I suppose I'll start off a bit and I'll just give a little bit of a rundown of, of how I got started with bees for those of you that don't know who I am or how I got started. So I did have a career, a 20 year career as an artist. And um, during that time, I had no particular connection with bees, no interest with bees and just um, was very busy with my my art career. And then when I was 40, Okay. If you wouldn't mind muting, if you've just joined, if you just mute. Chaba, Alter, was los? Was doch wie ein Gosse. Die Oma holt Hand und dann geht raus. Nee, das hat sie die Röntgebilder genommen gekriegt. Hello. Hello. Oh, that's it. Brilliant. Um, so, yeah, so I had a 20 year career as an artist. And then when I was 40, I collapsed and I spent the next seven years bed and wheelchair bound with a connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And so it was whilst I was sick and in bed, my husband built me a beehive. And the idea was I could lay in bed and I could watch the bees. And luckily we had the beehive and the bees came with a local man mentor and he taught me all about beekeeping so what he did was he put bees in and each week he would come up and teach me beekeeping and that's when I started to learn about the ins and outs of beekeeping and the way that 
most people are taught to keep bees. So this is where I sort of come into the, um, you know, the differences. So with conventional beekeeping, it really is all about the honey. So people will have the, um, have the bees take all the honey and often replace it with sugar or sugar syrup. And that was a big shock to me because as I was recovering my health, so over the seven years, I was trying all sorts of things to recover my health. And then I found that sugar really wasn't doing me any good. I really needed to be focused on um, more natural, natural um, food and, you know, a more natural, clean environment. And so the thought of giving sugar to bees really shocked me. So with sustainable and natural beekeeping, the key foundations are that you're not using chemicals or feeding sugar inside the hive. So because of the diseases where I showed you the um, bee gym earlier on, that is a different way of approaching Varroa mite. And Varroa mite is a pest that pests, you know, they get into the hive and they really affect the honeybees. And so chemicals have been used inside hives to treat or try and um, prevent Varroa mite from harming bees for about 30 years. And yet we still have a problem with Varroa mite. Now there's been many, many bee scientists who've been studying bees and they found that when bees live in the wild and they're not interfered with, with humans, so whether they're living in trees or whether they're living in just beehives and just being left to their own devices or even in the roofs of buildings, they're actually able to live alongside Varroa or even overcome it. So we now know we've got so much evidence that the bees do not need the chemicals within the hives. And one of the problems of using chemicals in the hives is it's creating infertile um, honeybees. So the drones are becoming infertile because they've actually been affected by these chemicals. So it's really important that we understand that before we interfere with bees, we know what we're doing and that we shouldn't be um, you know, we know what the consequences are of whatever we do, whether you do use chemicals or whether you decide not to use chemicals. We really have to be aware of the impact of that. So if you're going to be sustainable, you're really going to um, not want to be using chemicals inside your hive. The other thing that has quite an impact is bringing in queens or colonies from outside your area. It's very common practice that you'll go to a bee course and it's all about, you know, right, well, you're going to get your bees, you've done your training, get your beehive, and now go on this website or speak to this company and order your bees. And so bees are shipped all around the world through the post, which does quite often shock post delivery people when they realise they've got a buzzing box. Now, there could be some times where maybe shipping bees around could be, um, could be a good a good thing to do. However, more often than not, it causes more problems than it solves. So if you're bringing bees in from outside an area, for a start from the bees perspective, they don't know your area. So they're not aware of the predators, they're not aware of where the forage is, and so it puts them at a disadvantage. Now, if you're living in England and you bring in bees from Italy, those bees are gonna have completely different genetics. They're gonna have very different um, expectations of their environment. They're used to longer day or shorter days maybe, but warmer days. They're gonna be used to more stable seasons. Whereas in England, we could have a very cold snap in the middle of June or July. And so you don't want to have bees that are expecting it to be hot and sunny and be keep on laying eggs. So there's all these issues with bringing in bees not to mention the pathogens. But the main reason that I don't um, recommend buying in bees from outside seven, seven kilometers from where you are is because it upsets the natural balance of the other bee species. So I'm gonna talk in a bit about other bee species, but just start off with being aware that there are 22,000 species of bees in the world and only 11 of them are honeybees. In the UK, we have 275 species of bees, but only one honeybee. Now, if you were to buy in a packet of bees 
be it a queen and a few of her, her maidens, or whether it's a nuke, 10,000, whether it's a whole colony of 50,000, they will eventually grow to a full colony of 50 or 60,000 bees. And what you're doing is adding 50,000 more hungry mouths to feed in your area. So that is the most damaging thing about bringing in bees. And many people don't even consider it and have never considered it and don't even think about the consequences. So with the other species of bees, they are actually the main pollinators, the big fat fluffy bumblebees, the masonry bees, the solitary bees, because they're fluffier, because they've adapted to pollinate certain species of plants, they're the ones that do the pollination. But as long as we keep bringing in honeybees, we're actually forcing competition for very limited forage around world because of our agricultural systems we're losing a lot of the forage that the bees need all these different bees needs now honeybees will fly in a five mile or seven kilometer radius from their hive so they will go to wherever the forage is but many of the solitary and the bumblebee species will only travel up to one mile two kilometers you know they just don't go very far so how how do we protect and become more sustainable well, then when we decide that we want to become beekeepers, provide a hive or a home and just let the native honeybees or your neighboring honeybee colonies move into your hive. Work with local beekeepers within your area, but really be mindful about the impact your beekeeping practices will have on your area. So not using smoke. Now we all have this image that a beekeeper has a smoker. It's just what they all do and they're puffing away with their around the hives. Now, I admit that there are places in the world where you would not want to go anywhere near bees without a smoker. And that's where you have aggressive bees or where they are more wild bees. And so you, you would be stupid to go in there and try and take honey without using something to try and um, distract the bees. But when I first asked about what does smoke do, I was told, oh, it calms the bees. So from the beekeeper's perspective, you open up the hive, you've put the smoke on and the bees, they're not all over you. They go into the hive. Now, the question I asked is, well, why do they go into the hive? Well, they go into the hive to fill their stomachs up with honey because they think their hive is on fire. Now, to me, as a mother and a woman, I'm like, my goodness me, if I thought my house was on fire, I would instantly be in a state of fight or flight. I'd be running into the house and it's like, which photos do I take? What food do I take? What clothes do I take? What will I need? You'd be in a complete state of panic. Now, if you're opening up your hive every week and using smoke, you are putting your bees in a nonstop state of panic. So one of the first things I decided to do was not use smoke when I'm opening and use. And on, on the courses, I talk about different ways of working with bees, so you don't need to use the smoke. And more often than not, we're not even using anything. It's all about learning to work with your bees, with their natural rhythms, so that you're not dependent on terrifying them into a state that allows you to do what you think you want to do. Not feeding sugar. I've already covered this, really. But the, the sugar... Sugar is a toxin. It has been found to destroy the gut biome. It really affects the nervous system, not just for bees, but for humans as well. And when I was sick and um, trying to find out how to regain my health, I found one of the first things to give up was sugar. And that had such an incredible impact on my health. So if you um, suffer, from, suffer from hot flushes or of nausea, quite often it can be sugar. And the sugar is a toxin and your body's trying to get rid of it. So it will use whatever natural systems it has to rid that sugar from your system. And as, a, as humanity, we all eat far more sugar than we should. And sugar has to be processed by your body, by your, your um, liver and kidneys. So it, it causes added strain. And when we eat too much sugar, our bodies can't process it. So it's stored in fat and bees have the same problems. The difference with honey is honey is already being processed by the bees. It's already a food and it contains about 180 compounds. So it's much more complex 
and it's more easily digestible and it goes straight to the brain. So not only is honey very different for humans, but it's also very different for bees. And if you're gonna have healthy bees, do you think that if they have a diet of white sugar from August, think about your own house, think about your children and your family. If all you ate was white sugar for eight to 10 months of the year, would you really be at the best of health? So a lot of my work is, is really connecting human health with bee health. There's so much science and, and so many studies have been done on bee health. And we can really learn from that because the bees are very, very similar. I mean, I think they're more advanced than humans. They've been around 150 million years, so they've had time to sort of suss things out. But yeah, we can really learn from that. So sugar is a complete no. And I know that when you start off with beekeeping and you get to this time of year and perhaps your bees haven't been able to build up much honey stores and you have this fear that if you don't feed them sugar, they're going to die. But what would they do in the losing their natural instinct to store honey? I, I'll leave in a colony without enough honey in their bellies. They can't make honeycomb or the wax. Cap. They are going to die. So we have to have readdress our relationship with death, readdress our relationship with natural systems. And what is the big goal? What's the long term goal? What are we trying to do? Are we trying to mollycoddle wild insects so they need us to be looking after them all the time? Or are we trying to build strong colonies that can adapt to changing climates, to changing environments, and are healthy enough to protect themselves from diseases? And that to me is, is what is important for, for my work with beekeeping. So in turn with that, we're working with the bees' own natural rhythm. It's understanding what would the bees do in the wild? What do they do at different seasons? What can they do when they're given the freedom to fulfill their normal processes and really observing bees and looking at bees and trusting your intuition because your intuition is connected to nature so just think you know does this feel right just because everybody else does it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do so kinder keeping i love this phrase of kinder keeping and it made me think well what is kinder keeping and we tend to think that all beekeepers must be kind and I'm sure that all beekeepers love their bees but I do know that some beekeepers are treating their bees as if they're not living beings I really believe that the bees have a soul that they have a spirit they have these feelings um, and there is so much evidence that shows that bees have a great intelligence bees have been used to investigate um, all kinds of different um, processes to find out how the bees work how they communicate so I cannot believe they can be as intelligent as they are and not have feelings and those of you who have kept bees have you ever opened a hive when the queen has died and you literally hear a moaning there's this really mournful buzz and there's you know it can only mean they're grieving the loss of their queen so kindness and kinder keeping is actually approaching every interaction with your bees with kindness just how can you do what you're thinking you're going to do a bit kinder simple things like if you've lifted off a box don't just put it back on and, and have the crunch of all the bees that were on there just crushed to death actually think how can you replace a box not crushing the bees and maybe you'd think well I should be using smoke but actually you can use grass you can just brush them off maybe you need an extra pair of hands to help you when you're managing bees so that you can be kinder so just think about how you can introduce kindness into your work with bees whether it's the wild bees in your garden or bees that you're looking after in a hive intuition I think this is so important when I first started keeping bees, I had a gut instinct of where the hive should go. And as I've learned more about bees and how they connect with nature and their frequency and vibration, there are reasons why bees prefer to be in certain places. And 
just as all of nature is communicating to itself, the trees are communicating through the mycelium network under the ground, flowers are communicating by sending out um, radio waves to bees to say, I need pollinating. And I think we are part of that mass communication as well, but we've learned to switch it off. So if you tune in to your communication with nature, that's intuition. It's that gut instinct. And that's nature, everything that's alive all around you, giving you hints and warnings on how to live in accordance with nature. So nutrition, N for nutrition. Nutrition is so important. If you're eating white sugar, you're not gonna be healthy. So bees we know will search specific plants for their nutritional value. They will go for the weeds with the highest mineral content. So having a healthy nutrition, the bees already know is important to them. You could have two colonies next to each other in the same garden, and yet they will go to different plants depending on the medicinal requirements of that colony. Isn't that amazing? Diversity. So the diversity within your beekeeping is embracing the diversity of the other insects and the other bees in your area. It's not just having an orchard with 100 beehives. It's thinking, I've got an orchard, which bees pollinate apples? Do a bit of research, and I'll talk about that in a minute, about which bees do actually pollinate apples. And it's not the honeybees. So think about that diversity. What have you got growing in your area? What are you trying to pollinate? And which bees will pollinate those plants? And if you've got a healthy biodiversity, you can have the wasps that will eat the aphids that stop your flowers from blooming. You will have the hornets that will clear up any debris, or you'll have the birds that will eat the dead bees as they're brought outside the hive. You need that biodiversity in your area. So it's not just about having a colony of bees. We need to have all the different species, not just of bees, but of wasps, of flies, of birds, and of flowers and plants and weeds. So that ties in really with your environment. Now we think, oh yeah, the environment, it's, you know, whether we're, we're burning coal or logs, but actually there's so much about your environment. Are your bees in a noisy environment? You know, are you near a busy road? Is that noise going to be upsetting the bees? Is the hive underneath a tree that's gonna drip water on? How annoying would that be? Like a tap dripping constantly. So have a think about the entire environment. Are they next to a massive great antennae or a big electrical station? The bees are frequency and vibrational beings and everything in nature has a frequency and a vibration. There's sounds, there's noises, there's smells, there's things that we can't see. There's the pollution, there's the smog, there's the electromagnetic smog. How is that gonna affect the environment of your bees? And to just like humans, if you're in a toxic environment, which could even be a stressful place, you know, it could be stressful work environment, stress it with family, with friends, neighbors. If you can go home to bed and get a good night's sleep, you can cope with anything. So is your hive in a place where your bees can rest and really restore their energy? And rest is the key for everything. The biggest real aha and a shock for me when I started learning more about bees, especially having just recovered and then being busy and everyone was saying, oh, you're busy as a bee. And we all think, oh yeah, bees are busy. And then I discovered that healthy colonies of bees spend the majority of their time resting. They're not on the go all the time. What a shock. And we tend to look at bees and think they're on the go all the time. They only live six weeks and they've got three weeks inside the hive doing all the different jobs that need doing, the nursing, the feeding, the cleaning, the guarding. And then they have three weeks outside the hive where they're foraging, bringing back in the nectar and the pollen, and then they die exhausted after six weeks of life. But if they're in a stressful environment, no matter what that stressful environment is, whether it's chemical exposure, environmental toxins, whether it's the stress of movement, noise, 
lack of um, forage, bees are unable to rest. And that is a big shock. And studies on bees that were under a stressful environment, they actually found that their lifespan was reduced by 50%. Their life was halved and they were unable to rest. So what happens is the bees were constantly moving. They were shaking and they'd be found outside the hive shaking until they died. Now, what also happened within the hive, because their lifespan was shortened by half, they started doing jobs that they weren't ready to do. They were doing jobs that they weren't mature enough to do. So instead of waiting for three weeks when their wing muscles were all strong and they could go out of the hive and fly and collect the nectar and pollen, they were flying at one and a half weeks. So they were immature. They hadn't learned the wisdoms of the bees. Think about humans, if our lives were shortened by half, if we lost everybody who was over 50, think of all that wisdom. I wouldn't be here now for a start, but just think of the wisdom that we all gain through our living our lives in the right order and living for a long period of time. We learn things. And so rest is so important. So whether you are a beekeeper or a bee or just somebody who wants to be more conscious rest is the key to well-being so native bee species now as i mentioned earlier there's 22,000 species of bees around the world and different regions different continents have different numbers of bees so you can have um i think in north america there's like 4,000 species of bees um, Asia has just about all of the different species. They have the most, something like, um, or from each of the families of species of bees. So they, they have the greatest variety of bees. Here in the UK, we have 275 species. There's some great handbooks. There's a Stephen Falk book, which is the, the handbook for bees. But I've also put together with the um, Field Studies Council, this really handy document, which has 29 species of bees that you'll find around the British Isles and then on the back there's information about how you can um, look after bees and sustainably have honeybees and you have this chart that tells you which bees are around at what time of year and what sort of habitat they like. So now's the time to talk about the red mason bee. So if we look at a honeybee, there we go, just there, so that's your honeybee and you'll see it's quite smooth. It's not that fluffy. It has a fluffy thorax, but the abdomen is quite smooth. And the bee that is the most important one around where I live, where we have a lot of apple orchards is this one, which is the red mason bee. And you can see it has a sort of red fluffy abdomen. And so when you see these bees, they look very much like honeybees, but they have this sort of auburny red ginger glow, you know, a fuzz that's around their bodies. And because they have that fuzz, when they visit flowers, they pick up more pollen. And so as they go from flower to flower, they spread more pollen. And that's how pollination works. And so they're much, much more effective as a pollinator. And one red mason bee can do the pollination work of apples of 250 honeybees. <laughs> so we need these bees, but there's quite complex issues about their habitat. So before humans came around, they would nest in the empty plant stems of nettles or of thistles and the hollows, you know, these old dried out stems that they'd be hollow. The female would actually lay eggs. She'd lay three female eggs and three male eggs. And when humans came around, they found that we would build walls and so they started to use the cavity. So this is why the mason bee of the red mason bee is classified as a masonry bee because we bee hotels. So I've got this one here and you say, great, I've got this. This will be wonderful for my um, mason bees or for all kinds of bees. Now, the thing is, the red mason bee has a requirement. These tubes are only about um, 10 centimetres deep. The red mason bee determines the sex 
of the eggs she lays from the distance of the entrance of the tube. So she will measure here and go back and she likes 18 centimetres. So then she can lay three female eggs. Blossom comes into bloom. It sends out this frequency that wakes up these bees, these cocoons that have slept for a year, and they wake up and the male bees emerge and they all hang around the front of the building. Then the females emerge. There's a like an orgy. There's a mass mating that goes on with the bees all um, mating. And then the male and female will go and collect nectar and pollen and they'll start again. They'll find a new cavity or some of them even go back to the one that they were hatched from. So you could have a bee hotel and think, yep, I'm doing my bit for bees. But if it's the wrong length, either the red mason bee won't nest in it or what is more damaging, she'll only lay male eggs. And then we as humans are upsetting that natural balance. So sometimes a little bit of knowledge can be a bit dangerous and we need to be conscious of what are we trying to attract? What do we need to save and how can we best do that? So this is um, a picture of a lovely bee hotel that's in Sherbourne in a garden centre. And it's, it's much bigger than that. It's sort of like two layers. But there, there's a real mixture of different lengths and depths and shapes. And so that's going to attract all kinds of insects and bugs. And that's what we need it is that biodiversity. We've just got to have lots of different plants. Now, what's happening around the world, which is very concerning, is that the monocultures and the chemical agriculture destroys these different species of bees. Because the bumblebees, so like the, um, the red tail here in this picture, they actually, oh, actually it might be a garden bee, so I should get my species right. Was it no? It's an early bumblebee with its um, red bottom and two yellow stripes. So there we go, that's the early. So these bumbles, they actually live in communities in the soil. So they'll be in a community of between 50 and 200 bees. And they'll be nesting in there. Now, if you were to spray a field or spray your soil, all those chemicals will go in and just wipe out those bees. And then it's only the queen bees who survive through the winter. They've mated before winter comes and then they find a little cavity somewhere in the ground and they, they hibernate for the whole of winter. So if you were to dig up your garden, or plough a field, or extend a motorway and dig up all the turf, you're actually destroying all the next season's queens. And because they don't travel very far, you can wipe out whole species, not just the colonies, but whole species in an area. Now, what's happening in parts of the world? So for instance, California, where 80% of the world's almonds are grown, in the non-organic, chemically grown monocultures, there's a million acres of almond trees. And mason bees, different to our red masons, the blue mason bees, they pollinate almonds. So we know that the almonds, if they're pollinated by the mason bees, those bees will do the work of 250 honeybees. But what's happened over the last sort of 10, 15 years, partly due to ignorance of even the existence of these other bees, but mainly due to the actual environment of growing these crops, they've lost those bees they're no longer there and so that's why you have this mass pollination using honeybees to pollinate the almonds so all across America millions of honeybee colonies are put on trucks they're transported across America through the night and then they're dropped in these these farms to pollinate the almonds and then after the almonds they go on and they do cranberries blueberries cherries apples pairs and those bees will just be traveling for the whole of their life now there's several reasons why this happens we've lost the native pollinators people generally think that honeybees do everything and we need the honeybees to pollinate but also the beekeepers cannot compete with the mass fraud of adulterated honey so when you buy honey and it's less than five pound a jar, it more often than not is not real honey. So BP keepers can't earn a living selling honey. So they earn more money renting out their bees to pollinate crops. So you see, we have this really complex problem 
you know, if you suddenly say, well, we can't use honeybees to pollinate, these beekeepers are going to lose all their business. If we stop selling all the adulterated honey, then the beekeepers can sell their honey, but they're not making honey when their bees are pollinating because there's not enough nectar in the plants they're pollinating and they're actually having to feed their bees sugar just to pollinate the crops. So it's a really vicious mess that we've got ourselves into. And as long as we perpetuate it by buying products that are grown in this way, it's not gonna end. So rather than lobbying governments and signing petitions and saying, we've got to stop using this chemical or stop using that chemical, as long as you're buying chemically grown food, it's never going to stop because there's this argument that, well, we've got to use the chemicals to grow the food because you lot keep buying it. So if you really want to be truly be conscious, be conscious about every pound you spend, where does it go? What impact is it? having on your environment that is the most powerful thing you can do to save the bees is being conscious of your money so what we don't want to do is end up like they have in the Sichuan province in China where the environment got so toxic they lost their bees then they had to bring in the honeybees but then it was even then killing the honeybees and already in America 40% of bees in the pollination trucks get killed you know, they're dying, so they have to keep buying in more queens and breeding more colonies. But in Sichuan province, 45 years ago, the government tested the soil and said it would be 50 years before insects could return to that soil. 50 years. Now, that would be if they stopped using chemicals 45 years ago. They haven't because no beekeepers will bring their bees in to pollinate the pears or the apples. And so what they have to do is when the pears and apples um, come into bloom, they shut the schools and the factories and the children and the, mainly the women because they have smaller hands and they're better pollinators. They pollinate the fruit trees. And this is the biggest growing, you know, pear growing region in China. So the other thing to bear in mind is that it takes 25 people to do the pollination work of one honeybee but 250 honeybees to do the pollination work of one mason bee so why are scientists spending billions of pounds developing robotic honeybees with the understanding that we're losing our bees and we won't have anything to pollinate our food So you may have heard, you know, if the bees die, we've got four years left to live. And so these scientists have thought, well, we can extend that because we'll have robotic honeybee. But I think they're missing the point. What is actually killing all the bees? It's our environment. It's our food. And we're growing. We're, you know, we're eating the food that we're growing. That, so, so the reason we will die four years after losing the bees is because they're the canary in the coal mine and that's how long it takes to kill bigger organisms so this is why being conscious is the most important thing we can all do now we really have planet the bees are the key to everything and so this is why i am so passionate about sharing what i'm learning I started off keeping bees because I could no longer paint and I just felt a calling to connect with bees. I was sick because my connective tissue was damaged. And when I began to connect with bees and connect with nature, I healed. So perhaps that's what all of us have got to do. We've got to reconnect. We've got to find our connections with nature. And when our connections are broken, not only is the planet sick, but we're sick too. So bees and being bee conscious really is of vital importance. So if you do start kinder keeping, whether it's with bees or in your environment, you're actually going to have healthy bees. You're going to have a balanced environment. You're going to have increased biodiversity, which we all love. There's nothing better than sitting in your garden and seeing lots of different species of bees. It's so exciting. And 
you know, not only with the fact that you then know you've got more biodiversity, but the excitement that you've learned something and that you're starting to notice more, start walk, walking through a forest and you have no idea what any of the trees are. And then gradually you start to recognize different trees. And it's so rewarding when you can go up to a tree and you can think, oh, my, you've got that interest to go find out what it is. And it's the same with bees. So if you are kind of keeping, you then start to have higher quality honey and bee products. So much of honey is classified as adulterated because of what the beekeepers are doing. The chemicals they're using inside the hive are appearing in the honeys. The sugar or some of the other feeds, some people are feeding bees soya, genetically modified soya. They're mixing up these foods for the bees, all to replace the honey we've stolen. If we just leave more of the honey for the bees, we don't need to do any of that. We don't need to buy sugar. We don't need to buy sugar syrup or sugar fondant or soya mixes. We don't need to be mixing up concoctions. Just leave a good proportion of what the bees have collected for themselves. So in my talks, I can go, or on my courses, I go into more detail about exactly how much honey bees need and how they balance their nutrition and how you can harvest honey so that you're getting the best for you and the best for the bees. And there's lots of little tricks and things that we've learned over the years. And once you're doing this, you have happy bees. And what do you think it means if you have happy bees? It's less stings. <laughs> and I think the number one reason people will get nervous about keeping bees is they don't want to be stung. Why do you think the bees sting you? They're trying to wake you up. They're trying to stop you doing whatever you're doing. There's always accidents and, you know, if you pick up something and a bee's on it and you've squashed it, it's going to sting you. That's just biology. You know, if you're going to compress the abdomen, the sting's going to come out. But there's no need to be stung when you're taking honey. There's no need to be stung when you're just sat with your bees. The bees are stinging to heal us, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally. So if you can have happy bees, you'll be happy too. So what I've done is I've set up a foundation course. Oh, and interestingly, everything I wrote there about the foundation course has vanished. So you can actually scan this little QR code, which will take you to where you can, you can buy the foundation course. And in a bit, I'll share a code which gives you more information about all the courses. But the foundation course, I set it up as a sort of introduction before my full course because there's lots of things people want to understand before they commit to going into beekeeping. And if you already are a beekeeper and you're thinking, well, I wanna go more natural, but it's a big step. The foundation course really helps inform you about the place of beekeeping within society, within nature, within your life. So it's that, that good foundation so that you know then that when you go on to keeping bees in a natural way, you're ready for it. You've already got those basic understandings. It's also for people who don't want to keep bees, but maybe just want to help bees in some way. So if you want to know what to plant in your garden, what do your bees need? If you want to have an assessment of what's going on in your environment and whether it is good or bad for bees, if you want to know whether you are already doing things right or wrong. So that's the course for you. It's the foundation course. You can do it. It's all online. You can do it in your own time. And it's just sharing lots of information that I've learned over the years and real fast track tips on how you can start being bee conscious and you know much more aware and connected with nature as soon as possible so that's the foundation course then we have the full kind of keeper keeping course now i used to call this the naturopathic beekeeping course because i'm teaching how to keep bees naturopathically so that has four modules it's much more intensive each module again you can do them in your own time but what I do is I have a monthly live zoom call for people who are doing this course so wherever you are in the course whether you finished it or whether you've just started we have a live Q&A session and that enables me to share what's what I'm learning at the time so whatever's happening with my bees and also to answer questions so if anybody's got questions so this is 577 pounds 
it sets you up with everything you need to know about beekeeping. So we cover all the pests and diseases because just because you're not using chemicals doesn't mean you need to ignore your bees. The moment you have them in a hive or you have them in your area, you are responsible for their health and well-being. And if you're not using chemical treatments, you've got to know the signs of when your bees are sick and you have to know the alternatives to take care of your bees. Otherwise, that is really irresponsible. And what happens then is it gives all natural beekeepers a bad name. We, we become thought of as lazy beekeepers who are then damaging the whole environment. So I cover everything about the stuff that you really don't want to know, you know, but you need to know if you're going to be a responsible beekeeper. And then I also cover what you need to have, do, and how you can get products from the hive sustainably. So if you want to keep, you know, take honey, if you want to take propolis, I share recipes, I share everything about, you know, the equipment you're going to need and how you can have these different processes, the shortcuts. And again, being in our community with our WhatsApp group, we're sharing tips of where people said, oh, I've just found this little hack, which really helps when I'm taking honey or when I'm processing wax. And lots of ideas, because it can be very difficult when you've, you've got these products from the hive and you're like, well, how do I get the bee's knees out of this honey? How do I separate the wax? How come I've melted my wax and there's all this crud on the bottom? What do I do with that? And what is it? So there's all these things that we can cover when we're actually as a group together. So that's that course and the QR code there will actually show you more. Um, well, if you just wanna go for it, you can, but before you buy, I'm doing special offers for this weekend. Now for the, um, the first foundation course, if you buy it this weekend, you're gonna get a one-to-one -one half hour call with me to ask specific questions. So if you're thinking, oh, what do I plant? Or is this tree a good tree to put a log hive on? Or what hive do I get? Or um, what happens if I'm allergic to bee stings? You know, all these crazy questions that I've got quite a lot of answers for in my head. You can have that call with me because the foundation course is all online. And so you are left to do it. We have comments and chats, but you don't get to talk to me one-to-one -one on that course. Now, if you go for the full course, I'm offering you a place on a bee experience day. That will be a whole day with me where we will go out and visit my hives. We'll open the hives, weather permitting. I will share everything that I can squeeze into a day. So whatever questions you have, we can answer. You'll also come to my hive here. You'll have lunch. We'll, you'll actually see my kitchen set up. You'll understand about what environmental health rules you need to have if you're going to be selling your honey. You can literally pick my brains. And if there's a group of you, you know, I keep my groups very small when I do these Be Experience days, but you will actually benefit from all learning together and actually spending time with the bees. So when you buy the course, if you either mention in the comments here that you've got one, or if you email me, but we'll see anyway. And we'll just make sure that as long as you buy um, a course before the end of um, Sunday evening, then you'll get these special extras. So my team sort of say, having time with me now, because I'm running a business, I've got eight people that you know work for me, work with me in the team. The pressure is on for me to be running my business properly. And so my time is my most valuable um, um, resource. And so a lot of my um, efforts now, my concentration and my time is spent with my consultancy clients, which is far, far more than the cost of the, of the um, full course. So if I'm working with business clients, that wouldn't even cover half a day just to do that whole course with me. And that's because that's what pays the wages. That's what enables me to travel, to learn and to put on courses and and spread the, the wisdom that I'm learning. So I know it's an investment, but there is so much that you need to learn. And I have spent literally tens of thousands of pounds gaining the knowledge I've got through traveling, through attending lectures, through buying books, um, reading the books, the time and the experience I've had with bees and working with different beekeepers. And so, if you don't want to spend years and tens of thousands of pounds, then just use my knowledge and 
you know, we're learning all the time as well. So that's what I've got on offer. And if these are not right for you right now, these are the other ways you can work with me. I do the consultancy. I specialize with companies, hotels, landowners who want to have bees but in a sustainable way. That's my, my thing. So I do content for museums, for visitor attractions. It really is all about, um, about the business and helping people who are going to produce honey commercially. So that's my main work with consultancy. I write for several um, publications. Um, I do honey sensory analysis. So I trained in Bologna as a honey sensory analyst. So I work as a judge with honeys. So if you do produce honey, I do do one-to-one -one honey tastings and I will do an analysis of, of um, your own honey to determine what the floral sources are and give you tips. Um, I do online training. So if you have groups of people that want to do training for beekeeping, then I do that. And you can find me on Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, TikTok. And you can also just join my, my newsletter, my mailing list, and then you'll get to know what I'm up to all the time. So there we go. This is, um, this is the end. But now I'm going to answer any questions. So if any of you have got questions, I'm going to look in the chat if I can find it. Da, da, da. So, OK, right. Oh dear, <laughs> somebody's dash and has just eaten a sugar-free sweet that you found on the floor and now she's had to go. So, right, does the bee gym work in the same way inside and out? Yes, the bee gym is amazing. Let me just see, I've got one here. So this is the bee gym. Normally you'd put it inside a hive on the floor. So above the mesh floor, or if you've got a solid floor, you'd put it there. And you see, it's got these little, tapes little ribbons um, different sizes there's bits that stick up there's all kinds of variety of things that the bees can scratch up or move through and the idea is that it encourages grooming now scientists have found that when bees are left to their own devices or certain um, breeds of bees they've evolved to have grooming um, grooming abilities you know they will actually groom each other to um, to keep each other healthy but if you've got bees that don't yet do this this encourages it and so the bees will come down they can scratch because the varroa mite will tend to sit in the middle of their back between their wings or on their belly where they can't actually you know rub it off so the bee gyms are great they're about 15 pounds you can go to beegym.co.uk or there's most of the bee equipment suppliers will actually sell them I don't yet have them on my website, but it is something that I tend to have here in the shop every now and again. Um, but they are brilliant. And what I found is inside the hive, bees will propolize this down to the floor. So they obviously know that when they're crawling around on it and scratching, that they're, it moves and they don't want it to move. So they glue it to the base with their propolis. So it's really interesting that they, they obviously like it. And if you can't get it inside your hive, so if you've got an established colony in a worry hive, or it's this time of year and you just don't want to open it, just put this underneath the landing board outside the hive and you will find bees will come out. Either they'll come from inside the hive and they'll come out and have a scratch, or when they're flying in or when they're going out, they'll come in and use the bee gym. So it's absolutely amazing. Really, really good, um, good product. So there we go. So they are about 15 pounds. I've been working with a professor in Oman who's been doing scientific studies. One of the arguments you'll hear from, from skeptics of this is that it's not been scientifically proven. Well, I've been using them for um, 12 years and I don't have a Varroa problem and I just love them. They seem to work for me. So there we go. Let me have a look. Um, Oh, lovely. Uh, so somebody's got my document, used it a lot. Is that this? Is that the, the BID card? Yeah, lovely. 
it is I'm so pleased with it I wanted to have this for a long time because the field studies council had one but there were two b's missing on it that I wanted to add so I've added the um ashy mining bee which is this one here which is black and white because when I first saw one in my garden it looked so striking and I thought, my gosh, I've got a really exotic bee and it wasn't on the ID card. So I thought, goodness me, it must be really rare. And it's not, it's actually very common. So it's nice to have that one there. And then the other bee I've added is one of my personal favorite bees. And I'm very lucky that I have seen one. And this is the great yellow bumblebee. Now the great yellow used to be common all over Britain. And now it's only found in the highlands and islands of Scotland. So I put this on here because I believe the more we look, the more we'll see. And if people realise this bee hasn't yet been made extinct, and if you look at the kind of habitat that it wants, we can, you know, expand that habitat and encourage more of the bees to, to survive. So this is a really good chart. And I found, you know, the newt down the road where we look after the bees there. I did a bee audit in 2008 and we had eight different species of bees. This year, we've got 26 species of bees. So the biodiversity has really increased there. So um, I would like to encourage more bees in my garden, which are already very pollinator friendly focused and attract a variety of different bee varieties. Would setting up a place for a hive also be good, even though I don't necessarily want to be a beekeeper? Okay, so the bee hotels are good because, or even having a rough corner of your garden so that you can actually um, put your, um, you know, you've got a habitat for the bees. So that's somewhere for the native pollinators to nest and to rest and be safe in your environment. So that's a really good thing to do. If you'd like to provide a home for honeybees, but you're not wanting to keep bees, then a log hive is a really good idea. There was a picture earlier on in the presentation of a log hive and you could just have a hollowed out log, you attach it to a tree and wild bees, honeybees, they will just move in. And then you don't have to do anything with them. And Karen, I believe you're still in America. Now in America, there are rules about keeping bees in different regions. So some states, it's illegal to keep bees in your backyard. Um, some states it's illegal to have bees where you can't have frames for viewing. Um, but there are quite a lot of active beekeepers across America who are who are naturally beekeeping. So Jacqueline Freeman is one of them. Um, and there's, um, oh gosh, somewhere in California, there's a lot around sort of Portland, Oregon and California where you have more natural beekeeping. But yeah, just have a have a bit of a search in your area and just search natural beekeepers and just see who's coming up. And then you'll find out about who's making log hives or whether there's a workshop you can go on and have looks, you know, have a look around for things that are, um, you know, good hotels, bee hotels. Oh, and I know what I haven't announced is the winners of the um, of my challenge. So I had one person gets a free course and one other person gets a 50 pound voucher and the winners are. The person that gets a free course who I know couldn't come to this masterclass, which was a shame, but she is called Stacy Harris. So Stacy Harris, well done. You've got a place on the foundation course. So we'll send you the link so you can join that. Um, so hopefully that uh, you enjoy that. And then the winner of a 50 pound vote voucher off one of my courses, so that could be the foundation course, the full course, or the SCEP course is, um, I don't have your full name, but um, S Hayes. So again, we'll be giving, um, giving you a, a message to say that you've won the 50 pound voucher and we'll be getting that off of you. So thank you very much. Let me just have a check if there are any more questions. Um, oh, lovely. So thank you. So great. We've had people from Devon, from um, Enniskillen, Somerset, Alexis, who was on earlier. I know she's from um, Brighton way. So wonderful. So thank you very much, everyone who's 
who's um, joined me today. I hope it's been really informative for you. And if there's any way I can help you, then let me know and I will do my best. So um, thank you very much. And I hope you can all go away and be conscious and help save the planet and save the bees as well as saving ourselves. Thank you very much.